I basically started by reading um, an interview that was um, between him and my great aunt, um, and she interviewed him for her thesis um, paper. Um, and so, yeah, so I was reading that and kind of, you know, trying to see like what stood out to me. Um, so the installation is inspired by his experience um, fighting in the forests of Italy and France. Um, and, oh, I forgot to say, he was part of the 442nd Military Regiment, which was an uh, army that was basically consisted of all second generation Japanese American men. Um, and they basically put their lives on the front line. They risked their whole lives because the only um, positions that were open for them in the army was frontline duty, um, and that's it. So my, um, my grandfather described it as like a suicide mission. Uh, and so yeah, and so anyways, I was reading his interview and then uh, what really stood out to me was him talking about box holes. And so this is supposed to be kind of a, um, the structure is inspired by a box hole, um, which is, uh, it was basically um, what they would build during combat and they would, it would be used as like a place for them to like kind of hide in and shoot from, but also if they were injured, um, they can like go inside of it. Um, and so he was injured twice during the war and then talks about how he found these box holes as a place of refuge. Um, so something about that really stood out to me, like a place of uh, safety and shelter and just kind of like the inside versus like the outside environment. Um, and yeah, inside the box hole there's a video that I made that's um, I guess like a documentary. Uh, but it's a compilation of um, public archives that I got from Jana and the Japanese American National Museum, uh, and also our uh, family archives. Um, he kept a lot of images of himself, and he did a lot of writing. Um, and I also used his audio interview, um, and a lot of it is used in this video. Um, I also interviewed my dad. Um, so you'll hear like both of their voices in the video and um, interviewed him and asked him like what if my grandfather shared any information with him about the war and he said no. Um, and so, you know, kind of talking about, I think a lot of what I got was like grandpa was quiet, uh, he didn't talk a lot, he was very silent. Um, but um, I don't know, I guess I was a kid when he um, was still around and then he died when I was a teenager. So I knew he was in the 442, but I didn't know what that meant. Um, and I knew my family was in Japanese incarceration camps, but um, because it wasn't talked about a lot, I wasn't, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't really know exactly, you know, um, just that it was this huge historical moment that, you know. Um, and so anyway, yeah, it's, I guess um, a lot of what I found out about him is through um, my family members. Um, and it's, I guess all of us have like memories of him. Um, and also just from the information that I guess he left behind. I guess a lot of us found a lot more information from what he left behind from his archives and things. Um, and so it's kind of funny because he didn't really talk about these things with us, but um, in like a public aspect, he was like a docent at a museum. He visited a lot of like schools um, and did a lot of talks. And he was even in Ken Burns' documentary. He was interviewed, which I was part of and put it in here. But um, <laughs> so hopefully Ken Burns doesn't find out. But also, like I have the same last name as my grandpa, so I don't know. But anyways, I hope I don't get sued. But, um, so yeah, he just, um, I just think it's interesting that he like was so open to sharing these things with you know people he didn't know and the public. Um, maybe he saw it as more of like it's an educational thing and he wants to spread, but maybe he didn't want to traumatize us or something. But then I noticed with members in my family that um, all of us kind of feel like there's something missing. Um, I feel like even my dad like was searching for, for things. Um, and um, yeah, what else do I? Yeah, I guess that's it for that, and then I was 10. Um, and so I made like a tapestry. I'm very new to sewing, something I want to get more into. Um, and so I did these patches that were 
surrounded by this image um, and block printed on some of them. Um, I have a bunch in the front if any of you want to take their leftover. Just make sure you um, heat set them by throwing them in the dryer or iron over it if you use it. Um, but yeah, so one says freedom isn't free, which is a line that he um, used a lot, I guess, when he was talking to um, like the public because he kept his like um, 442 blazer and inside I found a note that said freedom isn't free and I showed it to my dad. My dad's like, oh, I think this is like what he would say to people. So it's this, um, I don't know, the slogan that, um, I don't know, I feel like also resonates with, you know, other people of color and struggles in the U.S. Like, um, it's basically a, that we have to fight for our freedom, um, which is kind of messed up. Uh, and then the other um, design I have is like a, this, this, these ones right here um, are, it's like a, it shows like a hand holding uh, the torch of liberty and the fire is, um, the flame is supposed to be remembrance of all the soldiers' lives that passed uh, during the war. Yeah, so I, I also just want to like say that um, I had so much help with this project. I'm so grateful that I had this opportunity because I've been wanting to tell the story for a long time and then I feel like, you know, the universe and like Kevin and Sharon had this idea of the Rose of Sala and the Garden of Remembrance. Uh, so I'm, I'm so grateful that I had this opportunity to share a story and also just um, the students like helped me cover this whole thing in mud. Um, and um, the sound is um, by like a sound designer named Trip. Um, she, they live in the Bay Area, and so yeah. So I had a lot of help with this project, and I just uh, I'm so grateful. So yeah, thank you.